Welcome to the What's Your Truth podcast, the show that not only showcases the best of independent artists, but also explores what inspires them, what drives them, and what they consider their fundamental purpose as an artist to be. Today on the show, we have the man, the myth, the legend, the living dead drummer himself, Nick Mason. Now, where to start? Nick is one of the most in-demand session and touring drummers in today's music scene. Originally from Buffalo, New York, and currently hailing from the jungles of Los Angeles, Nick is on over 100 recordings spanning the last two decades. And I counted, by the way. It was over 100. Really? Uh, at least per your website. I've never uh, even counted. And I just updated that like this morning, too, and I added like two more. <laughs> okay. I think it was this morning that I counted, too. So I think oh, right. I'm, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. So, in, in, yeah, it's wild including over a dozen projects currently in the works. His massive list of accomplishments include live and studio credits with the likes of Michael Grant and the Assassins, Street Drum Corps, The Rhythm Coffin, V2A, and glam metal band Pretty Boy Floyd, with whom he's currently touring. Additionally, Nick is a contributing writer to Music Connection Magazine, and he's a frequent panelist for the NAM Foundation, specifically on the topic of helping artists with un understanding and navigating the world of artist endorsement. He himself is an endorsed artist with Apex brand names, including Yamaha drums, pasty cymbals, head drumsticks, and more. Now, as if Nick wasn't busy enough, he's also been a drum teacher for over 20 years. Along with being a drum instructor at the School of Rock in Burbank, Nick currently has over 40 private students that he's showing the path to go from Little Wing to Monster of Rock. <laughs> now, all of those things aside, and from my own personal experience with Nick, a couple of things truly stand out about him. The first is his diehard professionalism and relentless work ethic. A man who does his homework, shows up prepared and on time, and is all about getting the job done. It is no mystery why Nick is one of the most sought after drummers on the planet today. And I've personally improved, learned and benefited from working with him. Beyond that, Nick is also infectiously enthusiastic about music and helping other artists. And he's just one of the coolest, most down to earth cats on the planet. It's an honor to be able to call him my friend, and it's a pleasure to have him on the show, ladies and gentlemen, Nick Mason. Thank you. I'm. I feel like I need to like tip you after that, or hire you to just be my hype man wherever I go. That was like the best intro anyone's ever done for me. <laughs> oh, thanks, man. Well, you know, I meant every word, and it's not like you haven't spent the last two decades plus earning that intro. So consider Thank consider that much. I've already been tipped. And I'm serious. Like, I know we didn't get to, we haven't been able to work together much, but just uh the i know at one point we were kind of in a band shortly together um for a gig and i learned a lot from those rehearsals um just in terms of your viewpoint on you know showing up prepared and and the work ethic i mean it really it was a very short and sweet time we had but i got a lot out of that you know so i appreciate that yeah of course that, that was fun uh um actually jamming with you for a little while with that project and stuff and it's a shame that thing never quite got off the ground i mean that that band had kind of it would resurface every couple of years and we'd, I'd play some shows with the guy and then all of a sudden it'd disappear for a while again and then sort of mm -hmm. slowly creep back in. And then, you know, and it never, it never quite got the traction that it deserved, unfortunately. Yeah, um, it is unfortunate. So, Cause the music was good. It, uh, you know, sometimes it's all about who's at the helm and who's controlling stuff and, you know, Sometimes people need to know when to let go and, and let somebody else take the reins a little bit too. And, you know, I mean, it's like that with, with most artistic people I find anyway, is sometimes, you know, you might be good on one aspect of things, maybe the songwriting and stuff, and then the business side you need help with or whatever. So true. Yeah. Cool, man. Well, shall we get into it? Yeah, let's, let's do it. Amazing. So my first question is how did you decide that you wanted to become a musician um I, I well i grew up in like a musical household i had a musical environment so uh my dad is a, a guitarist and owns a guitar repair business and so um i got to hang out in his guitar shop you know on weekends and stuff like that and uh, my mom's side of the family, they were all drummers. They, you know, my mom played drums growing up. Her brother played, he was in a, in a band in the early eighties when I was a kid and, um, their dad, my grandfather, he was a drummer. And then I had cousins that were drummers and like, so everybody on my mom's side of the family was all drummers. And if you played anything else, they kicked you out of the family. 
No, um, <laughs> but it felt like that because like a lot of the time, if you weren't a drummer, like your kid ended up becoming a drummer or you married a drummer or like it was, you know, it was like that on my mom's side of the family. So I, you know, I had a snare drum when I was a kid that my uncle got me when I was like two and I had a bucket of drumsticks and then there was no shortage of like guitar stuff hanging around at my grandparents' house that my dad, had, you know, left there because he had like a workbench uh, in at my grandparents' house, at his parents' house. But he didn't really use that anymore because he had his own business, you know, by the time I was around. But it was still like full of guitar parts and stuff like that, you know. So I was just kind of around it all the time. And then uh, eventually I just kind of decided, I was like, I think I want to learn how to play an instrument you know and uh and i picked the saxophone because i was <laughs> being i was when i was nine years old i was being very rebellious i was like i don't want to do what the rest of the families do and i want to do my own thing so i played the saxophone for a year and after a year of like walking to school having to carry uh, this gigantic case with me uh i was like all right i'm not playing saxophone anymore this thing sucks I'm going to play the drum. I'm going to give in and play the drums like everybody else in the family, because then all I got to do is bring a pair of sticks to school. The drums were there already. I thought I was getting out of it easy. <laughs> no. and, uh, and I stuck with that, you know. That's awesome. And that's really funny. I actually it makes me chuckle your saxophone story because I actually have an almost identical story. <laughs> when I was a kid, I was in middle school and I was going to play. I want to play an instrument and I took up the tenor sax. And I was walking to school and I was like, this case is fucking heavy. Screw yeah. this. And then that's, I switched to clarinet because the case was way smaller. Yeah. No, that's <laughs> that was exactly the same thing. Like I, I was, you know, nine years old and I probably weighed to like, you know, 40 pounds. I like the, the horn weighed more than I did. And I walked to school, you know, it wasn't a long walk. It was only, you know, a block or two that I lived from, from my school, but like I still walked. And like having to carry that thing to school sucked. And so, you know, the next year it was like, oh, now I have just a folder with my music book and a pair of drumsticks. And I just throw these in my backpack. And I was like, oh, I don't have to carry anything heavy anymore. And that was fine until I got into high school. And that's when I kind of, you know, I, I switched from doing orchestral percussion um, and switched to drum set where i was like well now you know i did the band and orchestra thing i can play a snare drum i can play a xylophone i can play a stand-up bass drum I, you know all that stuff and then i was like well now i want to play it all at once instead of playing one drum and having a guy standing next to me playing the other one now i want to do it all myself and i want to do drum set and so i made that switch and uh that's when thing the wheels fell off on my whole plan of getting out of it easy because then it was like oh now now I got to break this whole thing down and like put it in the car and schlep it to a gig, you know, <laughs> or bring it over to my buddy's house to practice or something like that, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's a whole other thing. It's like you become a roadie by yeah. default. Yeah, exactly. You know, so, but, you know, joke's on me, I guess. Although I stuck with it, so. I was going to say, you definitely stuck with it and you've definitely created success by a lot of people's definitions. So well done on that. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks. yeah. So what was the first experience you remember having with music? Um, my first experience, uh, you know, probably like going back to even before I learned how to play. Um, like I said, I had a snare drum when I was like two years old. Um, and I used to have it set up in my bedroom and my uncle was in this band in the early 80s. Uh, and, you know, like everybody in the family, we all had like a copy of their their demo tape kind of thing, you know. And I used to put my uncle's band's cassette tape on. I had this little tape recorder in my room and I would I would play his tape and I'd try to play along to it on my drum, which I only had the snare drum. So I didn't really know what I was doing. I was just kind of whacking away at it. But you know, and I didn't have any symbols, so I would play on the wall. I would just hit the wall to try to make the sound of the symbol and play the drum and that. And so I remember kind of trying to play along to my uncle's band when I was a kid. 
you know, again, I had no idea what I was doing. It was probably just nonsense noise, but that's probably my earliest memory of trying to do anything musical. Wow. Right on. No. And I mean, Hey, it was a starting point. Everyone needs a starting point. That was yeah. yours. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. I mean, even like though you just had the wall, it's like at least you're getting the idea of like there's a movement of hands upward when you're doing a cymbal, and oh, it's a starting point. Well, yeah, and my uncle's drum set was set up at his house, so anytime we went over to my aunt and uncle's house, like his drums were in the basement set up, so I got to sit down behind his drum set, and I would see that he's got all this other stuff, you know, and I just remember the hearing the sound of his ride cymbal coming through on the recording and just kind of focused on that. I was like, I like that. I like whatever that sound is i like that and i didn't have one so i just hit my wall because it was um you know a sharp kind of sound that was the closest thing i had to it that ride symbol right on yeah you know? awesome so i mean you kind of sort of answered this a little bit maybe okay. but who, who are the biggest influences on your work and why um well, yeah, I'm, I sort of answered it. I mean, my family was a big influence on it because they were all musicians and stuff like that, too. And they were very encouraging. But, you know, I didn't get any resistance from from them when I said, hey, I want to play an instrument. They were like, oh, you do? Great. You know, um, and then especially when I switched to drums, there was a lot more encouragement. Yeah. Uh, although my dad will tease me about it because being a guitar player, he's always going to tease me. But we've met in the middle with uh how we just shit on bass players all the time <laughs> you know, my dad and i are constantly texting each other those bass fucking players. weirdos we're constantly texting bass player jokes all the time and that's that's the middle ground that we've met on because i you know he's a guitar player and i'm a drummer um but outside influences and stuff like that you know i, I grew up listening to what is now considered classic rock stuff i grew up on a steady diet of aerosmith and acdc and stuff like that and discovered metallica at a young age and um those are all the bands that i grew up listening to and so it was those bands that had the biggest influences on me you know playing along to aerosmith records in my basement trying to figure out the song arrangements and stuff like that kind of helped me figure out my own approach to putting drums behind a song so when i started playing in bands you know i was able to help kind of with the arrangement i'd have a buddy come over and he would have a couple of guitar riffs and then i was like okay we should do this this many times and then we should switch to this part and then go back to that and like I, that's kind of how i learned to put song arrangements together so i did in my early bands and stuff i I didn't do a lot of the song writing. I did a little bit, um, but I ultimately did, just thought I wasn't good at it. So I started doing a lot more of the arrangement stuff where the guitar players would have all the riffs and everything. And then I would put it together and piece it together based on what I had figured out by, you know, learning this Aerosmith tune or this ACDC song or something like that going, OK, they did this and then went to this and then to that. And then they went back to the other part. And I was like, what if we do that? Let's take this riff and this riff and then go back to that other one, you know, and kind of figure it out that way. Right on. No, and that's cool. And that's, I tell you, man, the, the ability to arrange is invaluable. There are songs where it's like, you know, I mean, I've written songs, been writing for years, and it's like the arrangement makes all the difference because you can have a bunch of cool riffs, but if they're not chained together in a way that flows and gets the, the communication of the tune across, it kind of doesn't matter, so. Yeah, or sometimes you find out this part and that part don't work well together where it's like, okay, this this verse is great and this chorus is great, but they just they that chorus, that's a different song. Yeah, you know, that's right. That doesn't belong with this verse. We need something else for this verse. That chorus is gonna be its own song. So then you split it off and make two songs out of it. You know, you find that kind of stuff out too. Hundred percent. Right on. So what's the weirdest thing that's ever inspired you? Uh, the weirdest thing. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily weird, but I've definitely found motivation through stress and anxiety <laughs> where, okay. you know, you're, you're working on something and it's, it's just not 
coming together right or you can't nail this one part on a song and you're just struggling so hard with it and like i've been in this room where i've just taken my sticks and thrown them across the room and said fuck this i'm done and like just shut the lights off lock the doors and go home for the day and just call it a day and be like i'm done i don't even want to see a drum set for the rest of the day and then the next day i kind of always wake up with this fiery determination where I just come in and and like kick the door open in the morning and like just jump on the drums and and beat them into submission to do what I want them to do you know um so I guess I don't know if that's weird but it it's definitely you know I've never been a person who kind of gets caught up in in like a long-term depression um involving music i know a lot of people that they get burned out they take a break they have to step away for a period of time and i think the most i've ever had to step away from my instrument is like a day you know and then i'm right back at it um and and when i come back at it it's it's always like with more enthusiasm and more energy and more determination you know um so that's been kind of a weird motivator for me and and you know i don't know if it falls under the category of inspiration but it's you know motivation and inspiration can be pretty closely linked yeah 100 percent. i mean you know it's like there's a lot to be said for being able to channel that frustration into a creative force which to me that's a part of inspiration that's kind of one of the ways that the muse can work so um i think that's awesome and it's it's a good lesson to learn too is like hey sometimes sometimes you just have to step away for a minute and then when you go back just really persist and you'll get where you're going you just got to keep powering through yeah yeah and sometimes you need to set it down just to you get too close to something and you have to reevaluate it and i i would that happened you know, before, uh, before we jumped on this call where, uh, I've been in this room since 10 o'clock this morning and I'm doing a series of recording sessions for, um, background music for TV shows right now. Yeah. Um, I, I work with a producer buddy who, um, he does a lot of placement on TV for, you know, reality shows and game shows and stuff like that. And you, you hear like, you know, someone drops a glass and you hear this big dramatic, you know, pause and there's this music beat that comes in and then it's like, you know, the, the music is trying to uh, fabricate an emotion that might not even be there on the set or whatever, but he's the guy who's making that stuff. And so I'll play drums on a lot of his stuff. And every once in a while, he'll just send me a big batch of songs and be like, here, you know, lay down some drums for me. And yeah, I was working with a song for a couple of hours today and um i just wasn't happy with it and i got it to a place where it was like okay this is fine it's passable it's like by anyone else's standards this is it's done and i sent them a you know a a rough mix of it and said you know here's kind of what i'm thinking and yeah he he was like great cool send me the files and i was like "Eh, eh, not so fast (laughs) i'm not totally thrilled with the intro i want to i want to try something else i don't know what i just i'm not happy with it it's not up to my standard yet and so you know i'm gonna come back to it tomorrow i'm not gonna when we're done with this i'm not gonna turn the processors back on and start hammering on it again i'm gonna give it a day i'm gonna come back to it tomorrow morning with a fresh set of ears and a fresh perspective and try a couple new things tomorrow and I can pretty much guarantee that I'll have it done tomorrow. I just know that I'm not going to have it done today. You know, I got it to a place where he was fine with it and he was happy with it, but I was like, ah, I can do better. I know I can do better. That's huge. And that's a great message too, man. It's just having your own integrity and having your own standard. It's, you know, good enough. Isn't really good enough. It's gotta be something that you know is your best product. Yeah. And, and I do have very high standards, especially for myself. You know, I don't ever want anything to be put out there that could be questionable or that people could pick apart. Like anything that gets released, it's got to be bulletproof, at least on my end, you know, 
they could talk all day about, oh, the vocals are flat, the guitar is out of tune or whatever mm -hmm. it is, but at least they can't say anything about the drums. Mm -hmm. There's nothing they can say about the drums that's going to be like, oh, well, the drums are terrible on this. Nope, the drums are great on that because I made sure that it was bulletproof before I sent it off to the producer or the artist or whatever. You know, and I tried to uh, pass that same sort of standard on to my own drum students too. And I had this exact conversation with a student of mine yesterday where uh, she's a nine-year-old kid and she felt that this one thing that I had had her working on, she felt she needed more time with it. She's like, I, I don't think it's good enough. I don't, I don't think I got it quite yet. And I said, well, let me be the judge of that. Play it for me. And she played it. And I said, there's nothing wrong with what you're doing. I said, you're your own worst critic. And that's a good thing. That's a great thing. I'm my own worst critic. I, I will be the person that says, oh my God, this was terrible. This sucked. And then other people will be like, what are you talking about? It's fine. It's great. You know, I said, so you might not think it's ready. You might not think that you're nailing this part, but I listen to it. And I'm telling you otherwise, you're just being really hard on yourself. And that's a, that's a great quality to have when it comes to putting out your own music and putting things out into the world is making sure you have that standard. That's awesome. That's so, so freaking, that's, that's awesome. And nine years old, man, that's it, those, that's the time to get that ingrained into them if you can. So that's so great. And that's one of the, great yeah. things about the fact that you are a teacher and that actually it's funny you kind of basically just answered my next question which was how has your art influenced other people and there may be more of an answer to that but that certainly seems like it fits the bill there is imparting that work ethic and that's that concept of having your own standard i mean that's a huge lesson for any artist to learn yeah yeah it, it is and and i uh influencing other people is is one thing where it's like it, it's always nice when you get, you know, a message on social media or an email or or even in person, someone comes up to you and after they've seen you perform and they tell you how great you were or how much of an inspiration you were, an influence or something like that. It, it's always wonderful. I had a kid in um, Australia wrote me like three days ago. He's 15 years old and he was like, I was at, you know, I was at this show that you played there and. I just got to tell you like how much of an influence you've had on my playing and this and that. And like, he's putting drum videos out on Instagram and he's really good too. It's great. And it was really nice of him to, to um, credit with me with, with some of his inspiration. It was flattering. It was great. Um, but the, and that's always nice to have, but that the direct source of like actually teaching somebody else how to do it, that's, that's huge, especially because you'll get to see, you get the reward of seeing where that student might go with it. Some of them might just be hobbyists and they just play for fun. And some of them might get into their own bands and start playing. And some of them might even go on to bigger and better things. I have three students right now that have since become teachers themselves. And like, these were kids that, you know, they started with me when they were nine, 10 years old, 12, whatever. And like day one, like never even sat behind a drum set, never even held a pair of sticks. And now you fast forward a decade and they're teaching other people now too. And they're in the same position I'm in where they're sitting behind the kit with a student teaching them how to play. And that's so cool. That's amazing. Yeah. You know, having like multiple generations now coming down through lineage of, uh, you know, with this instrument and stuff and being able to see and connect those dots where it's like, well, my teacher taught me how to do this. I taught it how to, I taught this person how to do it. And now they're teaching someone else how to do it. That's, like, so, oh, man. that's so cool. That's, that's awesome. So, awesome, you that's know? Got so rewarding, man. It's, it's unbelievable. It's, it's really, really, really cool. Um, and, uh, yeah, like just watching them work puts a smile on my face, watching them teach others because it's like, oh, man, that's they're doing so well with it, too. And it uh, it just it makes you feel good. You know, it's it's really nice. And then 
also like having students that maybe they don't become a teacher, but maybe they get into their own bands. Maybe they start having their own musical accomplishments and stuff like that right now. I got a student who uh, is touring the world. She has her own solo music, but she's also playing for Jerry Cantrell. She's in his band playing keyboards right now. And like, yeah, she was one of my drum students. You know, she's multi-instrumentalist, plays a lot of different instruments. She writes and records all her own stuff, you know, so she's doing her own solo work too. Um, but like her day gig now is touring for, you know, Jerry Cantrell, you know, and I've had other students that have, you know, done national competition drum lines and stuff like that. And I had a student a couple of weeks ago that his first band is like going into the studio for the first time to record. So I was like, great, let me show you how all of this works. And I, you know, I said, we're going to practice doing a recording session. So that way, when you're there and the red light turns on, you know what to expect. You know what what's, you know, demanded of you. And you'll be able to get your parts done and get the takes in that you need to, you know, quick enough. So that way everybody else can spend the rest of the time in the studio doing their parts, you know? That's great. Wow. What a great lesson. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was really cool. I like trying to prepare students, not, not only just to learn how to play the instrument, but like to teach them kind of what the standards are in today's music industry. Cause it is, different than when you and I were kids it's different than when our parents were kids like the music industry has evolved and changed so much just in the last decade and it's still changing and the demands of uh, a physical human being like flesh and blood human being the demands of them are different than what they were you know when our heroes were playing so you know you're not especially as a drummer nowadays with technology, everybody's got pro tools and everybody's got, you know, BFD or whatever, you know, drum sampling program or whatever, and they can program in whatever they want, but that doesn't necessarily mean a human can duplicate it, but they want you to, and you have to figure out how to make that happen. And, you know, they want you to be this mathematically perfect, you know, laser precision machine behind the drums but humans aren't built that way humans aren't engineered that way and so again in order to meet that standard that people are setting for you you know it takes a lot of work it takes a lot of dedication and you have to know what to focus on how to focus on it how to play it that certain way you know i make all of my students play with a metronome like 100 percent of the time it doesn't matter how old they are it doesn't matter how long they've been playing for the metronome gets introduced within the first two to three lessons and then it's a staple and it never goes away you know when i was growing up as a kid that wasn't the thing no you know a lot more emphasis on feel growing up yeah exactly exactly no and it's funny it's you're, you're totally correct i mean you think about like I mean, for us, this would be like classic rock, even when we were younger. But like, you think about like Led Zeppelin. Like, I don't even think John Bonham did play to a click because he couldn't. Mm-hmm. It was all feel all the way, and everything was recorded live with the whole band in the room. You know, right, right. And it's just so, not. It's it's not really done that way anymore. That's not the standard. I mean, there's still purists. There's still guys that like to do that, and it's yeah. great when you can. Um, but most of the time, that's not the case. You know. I'm, I record in this room um, constantly and it's all done through email. I actually haven't stepped foot into a recording studio, like an outside studio in two years. Wow. Maybe, maybe longer. It was, uh, it, it, I think it was sometime in late 2020, early 2021 was the last time i actually like had to take a drum set out of this room and bring it to another studio wow uh but in the last three years you know i've recorded on you know dozens and dozens of projects for people sometimes it's just a song sometimes it's an ep sometimes it's you know 
12 songs or 15 songs for someone's album or whatever, but I do it all right in this room and it's just done through email. So in that case there, you can't vibe with your bass player or your guitar player because they're not even here. They're just sending you a scratch track that they recorded by themselves to a metronome. Right. And then I'm just throwing it in the computer and then doing the same. And I'm listening to the click and I'm listening to what they did. And I can try to vibe as much as I can with them. But I know that ultimately what I have to do is stay as tight to that click as possible because their tracks are going to get deleted anyway. Once I send them the drums, they're going to start over and just play to my drums. You know, they're not sending me final takes. They're sending me demos. Right. My take has to be the final take. So it needs to be as solid as possible mm-hmm. for me to send it over to them. That way there's less to do on their end, you know? Right. Um, and that's just kind of the way it works now, you know, but there's, there's upsides to it also. Cause I, now I get to record with people all over the world. Right. And you don't have to be in California and we don't have to go down to a studio somewhere. They can be wherever they can be in another country. They can be in a, you know, on the other side of the planet and just email me the tracks. Great. I'll bang it out. I'll send you your drums back, (laughs) you know? (laughs) Totally. No, it's true. There's definitely opportunities to be had with the new reality of the music industry. And uh, yeah, but it is, it's such a different world. And I mean, same here, most of the recording I do, I can't remember the last time I actually walked into somebody's studio and tracked something for them. Um, Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and um, like, like I said, some people are purists. Some people still want that. And that's great. I'm all for it. I, I love doing it old school. Um, but yeah, I last time I was in a, in a different studio was, yeah, it had to be like early 2021. And even before that was like early 2020, like right kind of when, when things closed and shut down. And I'm talking like the week things closed. Yeah. Like I, I went and had a session at a studio. It was like, oh, well. We got all day now. Let's go down to this studio. You know, the studio was still open. Um, so, uh, yeah, that. So it's it's been over two years since I've stepped foot into a recording studio that wasn't my own. But it's it's not for lack of work. It's I'm still working. It's just all done remotely now. You know. And it's like you get some good outboard gear, you get a, good, a couple of good preamps and some mics. And if you know how to position things and set your room up, you know, you can accomplish what you need to. That's right. So, yeah. 100%. And do you have any pre show or pre studio rituals? Uh, not pre studio. I like to try to be as prepared as I can if I, if, that's available to me. Like I like to work through the song a few times first. So that way I can kind of memorize the uh, arrangement and, and stuff pre-show. Um, before I go on stage, I just like to warm up. Uh, I stretch, you know, I'll take some time in the dressing room about 30 minutes before we hit the stage. I'll stretch uh, and I'll, I'll, run snare drum drills on a practice pad with like a really big heavy overweighted uh pair of drumsticks to kind of get circulation moving get my hands loosened up and stuff now, i like to warm up for about a half an hour before going on stage but that's kind of the only that's the only ritual i got for going on stage is just kind of warming up and making sure i'm i'm ready once the you know i got to count in the first song right on and then shifting gears a little bit, what risks, if any, have you personally taken for the sake of your music? Well, I mean, the biggest risk was moving across the country. You know, growing up in growing up in Western New York, uh, and then deciding, hey, I'm going to go to California. I mean, that's a huge risk because while I had some contacts out here and I knew some people out here already, um, it it was just kind of almost starting over. Like there was one band that I was playing in that was based out of here and they were, I was just flying out for shows. Uh, And then it was like, well, I'm going to move. 
And I, I didn't move for that band. It was just a convenience thing of I was playing with them and I was going to move here. So it was like, oh, great. You can continue to play with the band. Yeah. Um, so at least I had like, you know, was able to hit the ground running a little bit of like, all right, I already kind of had a band that I was working with when I got here. Uh, and that that kind of helped get my foot in the door in some places where it's like, okay, well, I've played some of the clubs out here already, so I'm already familiar with them. Uh, I can already talk to some people at the clubs because I've already played here, you know. Um, and I had some friends and stuff out here already, too, that I was able to hit up and be like, hey, I, I'm moving to town. I'm here, you know, and they kind of helped out and said, well, come see me play tonight, meet some people, stuff like that. Um, but that was a huge risk. It could have gone disastrous. It could have, you know. I could have just spun my wheels or things could have gotten stagnant real quick. And and I know other people that have made that same move that they didn't last, you know, um, I, I was kind of always told if you can make it past the two year mark, you'll be fine. Um, and so I kind of just held to that of like, I got to make it two years. I got to make it two <laughs> years. And here I am like hitting 14 or 15 years now, you know? So, wow. um, you know, but that was, that was probably the biggest risk was like, pack all your stuff up, put my drums in boxes, shipped them across the country, you know, and, uh, and, and just kind of relocating on the other side of the country. Yeah, no, that is a huge change. And again, a similar story here. Yeah. Um, when did you come out here? I came out here, I think it was right after you. I moved out in 2010. Okay, yeah. So not long. I came out here in uh, in 2009. So you were just after. Mm -hmm. I, I knew it was around the same time, but I couldn't remember if you got here first or not. Yeah, nope. You beat me to it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. By a year. Yeah. And it was funny too because at the time I don't even think I knew you had moved. It was kind of an interesting fact that we had both ended up out here. There were a couple of guys yeah. from Buffalo, musician friends of mine, that that happened with. Where I got out here and then I came across and I was like, "Oh, you're here too? Okay, good." Oh yeah, they're one of the first bands I started jamming with after I had moved here. The guitar player was from Buffalo, and I was like, "No way, we didn't know each other though." But when he told me like what band he used to be in in high school i was like dude our bands have played together before i was like i was in this band in high school and we did shows together and like i had never known him i had never met him and then all of a sudden we're playing in a band together and um that's happened a few times out here like there's a, a another kid he's he's a little bit younger than us um bass player he and i like his the first time he ever stepped on stage in california he was playing with me and we found out after I was like, oh, you're you moved here from Buffalo. That's where I grew up. And he was like, no way. Kind of. The, you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, I've, I've met a lot of people. There's a lot of people that gravitate out here and, um, from from that area. And it's great because then you get a little, you know, a little piece of home and someone to be a buddy with who's familiar, you know. Yeah. No, there is definitely. um People from Buffalo, there's definitely certain realities that are shared among them that others tend to not get so much. So it is, it's kind of like a brotherhood uh, in a way. And it definitely is, uh, it's, like you said, it's a little piece of home. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it's it's nice to have that, you know. Um, you can you can kind of, yeah, you, you just got someone from home to be buddies with and, and you can connect on a, a level that, you know, someone you just met who's a stranger, you won't, you know? Yeah, and reminisce about four years of football hell and the only place in town where you can get decent chicken wings. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> that It's that kind of stuff, you know? And it's funny, too, because, like, anytime I bump into anybody who's, like, wearing a Bill's shirt or a hat or something like that, like, I got to call them out. <laughs> and I was like, yeah! You know? <laughs> um, but they do it to me too. I've had people, I've been wearing like a Sabres hat, like at a farmer's market and someone's like, someone will come up to me and like, you know, say, Hey, kind of thing or, or, you know, comment on the season or something like that. It's great. I love it. Definitely. Right on that. Well, getting back to risks, what's the craziest risk you've ever seen another artist take for their craft? Um, uh, you know, 
uh, putting out, writing your own material, writing your own music or, and coming up with your own art and then putting it out for others to consume is a huge risk for anybody. And that's a, that's a risk we all take as musicians. Anybody who's ever plugged a guitar into an amp or sat behind a drum set or that in itself is a risk of putting something so personal in, in view of, for others. Um, uh, I've seen some people take that to extremes where they really, really are dedicated to making their art work and, and trying to climb the, the success ladder with it and stuff like that. And they'll take big financial risks, you know, whether it's, um, signing with a management or a record label company um or uh just investing your own money back into your art in order to uh achieve the next rung on the ladder kind of thing um that I i've seen a lot of people do that and it's always a gamble you know, it's always a huge, huge roll of the dice on like, you know, believing that not only your art can be appreciated by other people, but enough people to kind of help lift you up to that larger status. And you know what I mean? And put you on a tour around the world or something like that, that enough people like your art um, to get there. And that's the big thing. I know a lot of people that have believed in their art that much, but at the end of the day, it just wasn't, it just wasn't good enough, you know? Um, and vice versa. I've heard some stuff too, where it's like, oh, uh, this is not, not my thing, but somehow it got popular. <laughs> um, so, you know, anybody who takes that sort of risk, uh, it's got, you know, anybody who's taking the risk to actually just put their music out for others to hear has always got my respect. And then um, anybody who's taking that big financial risk of like investing all of their money into their craft and their art. That's another thing, too, that like it's it's commendable, but it's not something I would do <laughs> like, you know, I'll I'll reinvest into my own uh craft i'll invest into drumming you know i'll upgrade my microphones and i'll buy that new snare drum i got my eye on and i'll replace my cymbals when i crack them and change my drum heads you know that's how i reinvest financially into my own art sure. is by upgrading and maintaining the equipment you know uh but if i wrote a bunch of songs uh, I don't know that I would have the confidence to drain my bank account to push those songs onto an audience. I don't know that I would have the confidence to do that uh, the way some other people do, you know, that, so. <laughs> no, that makes sense. And I mean, it really comes down to, I think what your purpose is for what you're doing and with you, I mean, it makes sense because you're like, you've built a whole career out of doing what you do for the people and the things you do feed that and, you know, as much as art is not about money, it's also not really viable to be living on the street, um, right. no matter what your profession is. So it's also like being practical about that and really thinking with the business side of it, which is something that unfortunately still seems to be lacking in the artist community is a business sense of what they're doing and doing things in a way that is sustainable, mm -hmm. you know. So I think that's, again, a, a great lesson. Yeah, it's a it's like I said before, it's a huge gamble that you're going to get that return with your investment. Um, you really have to just kind of rely on other people and whether or not they're going to like what you're doing, right. you know? Yeah. That's the big thing is that you're leaving it up to other, the judgment of others. So that's, yeah. that's frightening. It is. And it is a huge risk. You're totally correct. So yeah. shifting gears a little bit, what's one thing about you that would shock everyone to know? Uh, 
shock people. Uh, I'm trying to think if they're I'm trying to think of uh, stuff. Well, uh, I was in the Boy Scouts growing up. Oh, cool. And and I took it all the way. I became an Eagle Scout. Whoa. And uh, yep. So I I am an Eagle Scout. I was uh, I went through all the ranks that you can go through. Um, all the way up to, um, you know, within scouting kind of thing. I, I started out as like an assistant patrol leader, went to a patrol leader, ended up going on the, the staff, the junior staff being, uh, you know, through various roles, you know, scribe and quartermaster and assistant senior scout something. I can't even remember now. And, and then even after I, became an Eagle Scout and then turned 18, you, you kind of have a choice. It's like, all right, you're done now or continue on as a, as a scout leader. And I, for one year, I was an assistant scout master with the troop that I grew up with. Um, but I, you know, I was 19, I was in college and, uh, unfortunately that I just didn't kind of have the available free time that I needed to dedicate to it, but I'm still very, very close friends with a number of the guys that I was in scouts with growing up. We still talk regularly. Uh, when I come home to visit, we hang out, you know? Um, so yeah, so that's one thing that, you know, it's not super public knowledge. I mean, people who know, know, um, but I not broadcasting it kind of thing because, I mean, it doesn't serve much of a purpose to my career, so I, I guess I didn't need to broadcast it. Um, but it's it's not like I'm ashamed of it or anything. I'm very proud of it. And uh, yeah, so I I grew up, you know, as a Boy Scout. That's awesome. No, yeah. that's I did not know that about you, Nick. That, yeah. And that, that's a, you, you're an even more handy guy to have around than I realized. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I learned a lot of valuable life lessons uh, growing up because that's what it was. It was learning to become an adult. It was learning responsibility, learning how to take care of yourself, um, learning how to care for others. I mean, I that really was crucial in my development as a kid, especially in like those really important years when you start to you know, when you're 12, 13 years old and up through high school, like it's very, very, very important to have strong role models, have good influences on you growing up and stuff like that to help shape you into the person you're going to become. And I attribute all of that and to my time within uh, the Boy Scouts. You know, it's not just tying knots out in the woods and, you know, learning how to light a fire with two sticks. That's part of it. But it, it was so much more than that. Um, and I really, really uh, am thankful for my time, uh, you know, within that organization, you know. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, this is funny. I can, I can show you. I, uh, I always carry like a Swiss Army knife on me because you never know when you're going to need it. Right. Yes. The one that I carry on me is... I got this. I, it's hard to see, but that right nice. down there is the the Boy Scouts of America emblem. Oh. And I got, I got this when I graduated. This was a gift that I got when I graduated from Cub Scouts into Boy Scouts. I got this as a gift. Um, and I've had it ever since. And I carry it on me every day. Oh, that's awesome. So, and I, and I still have a thousand and one uses for this thing. Like I use it yeah. almost every day too. I, you never know when you're like, Oh damn, I need a screwdriver. I, you know, like, <laughs> Oh no, dude, multi-tools are where it's at. I am always with a multi-tool no matter where I go. Oh yeah, for sure. I carry, I carry this, this one's just a blade. Um, but I, like I said, I find use for it constantly. And then I have one that, um, actually I was in Switzerland on tour, uh, last year and we had a day off and I went to a Victoria Knox store and had a custom Swiss army knife made with it's laser engraved with my name on it and everything. Yeah. And that one literally like fixed our tour bus like three months <laughs> later where something happened with a hose or a thing or something. I don't remember what it was. We're on the side of the road. My bass player comes on the bus and he's like, 
you still got your Swiss Army knife on you? And I was like, <laughs> yeah, he goes, great. I need a screwdriver. And I gave it to him. And he was able to, like, repair whatever it was with the Swiss Army knife that, you know, he got one, too, when we were in Switzerland. And, you know, a couple months down the road, and it, was, it already came in handy and kept us on, kept our bus from breaking down. You know, we were on the side of the road for maybe 20 minutes, and then it's like, all right, we're ready to go. Let's go. Oh so you never know when you're going to need something like that, you know? That's awesome. Right on, man. All right, I got a fun question for you. Cool. If, you were, if you were going to write a book about your career up to this point, what would you title it? That is that's a that is a lot of fun, actually. Um, uh I don't know. I'd want it to be something fun. The most famous drummer you've never heard of. <laughs> that's actually a good title, and that's very true. I guess, I mean, I feel like more people have probably heard of you than you might think, or at least of Living Dead drummer. Maybe, maybe. I mean, it's, there's recognition here and there, but I, you know, it's, I think for the amount of work that I do, you know, the, the amount of time I spend on tour or spend recording stuff, you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate to be able to keep a roof over my head by playing music. And I've been fortunate enough to have this be my full-time job for pretty much most of my adult life, but I'm not, you know, on the cover of any magazines and I'm not, I don't have a bunch of songs blowing up on the radio. Um, and, you know, most of the tours I do are smaller scale and stuff like that. Like every once in a while you might get the plane and the, or the tour bus, but I still do my fair share of tours in the back of a van. Um, again, I, I make a living. I'm, I'm a working drummer. I'm not flipping burgers on the side or anything like that. I make, 100% of my living from sitting behind a drum set every day. Um, and, and, but, you know, like I said, it's, I'm not, I'm not some big famous rock star or anything like that, you know? So yeah. Most, most famous drummer you've never heard of. <laughs> right on, man. So what are your plans for world domination? Uh, you know, uh, I, just keep kind of slowly trying to climb the ranks one one rung at a time um i enjoy what i'm doing i enjoy teaching i enjoy um recording and touring and stuff like that i'm always looking for new people to work with new artists to collaborate with whether it's in the studio or it's live um uh, I'm always looking for more opportunities to put me out on the road and stuff like that. Uh, so it's just a matter of continually doing those and, and, you know, hunting down bigger and better gigs kind of thing, you know? Absolutely. Right on, man. And then my last question for you, and just to revisit the introduction to the show, the show not only showcases the best of independent artists that also explores what inspires them, what drives them and what they consider their fundamental purpose as an artist to be. So Nick, what's your truth? Um, I, I think honestly, it's, it's just to, just to leave a legacy with this ridiculous instrument that I chose to learn when I was a kid, you know, I didn't start out, with world domination in my sights, I started out because I thought it was going to be fun and it is, if it wasn't fun, I wouldn't be doing it. <laughs> um, but, uh, now that I've, I've kind of been around the world a few times and I've played some of the biggest, uh, you know, venues and some of the smallest ones, I think just, um, I think that's, that's what I'm here for. Like that's, that's why I'm here. I'm here to play this instrument for people. And if it inspires other people to play that instrument or to uh, uh, at least achieve their own goals with, with whatever instrument they do play, uh, then I think I've served my purpose here well. Right on, man. That's awesome. Man, thank you so, so much for doing this interview with me. This was awesome. And uh, 
I mean, I've known you for a while and I learned yeah. shit. <laughs> you know, so really well, cool. Before we sign yeah. off, I did want to give you 60 seconds to plug anything you have coming up. All things Nick Mason. Fire away, man. Floor is yours. Sure. Um, well, coming up, uh, I'm going to be back on tour pretty soon. So at the end of this month, end of April, um, I'll be back with Pretty Boy Floyd. We uh, will be playing uh, one show in Southern California. We're going to be headlining the Whiskey A Go Go, which we do once a year. Uh, it's always great. It's always sold out. It's awesome. Uh, then we're going to be zipping over to Vegas and playing in Vegas. And then we go out on tour with the 69 Eyes in May. So early May, we'll be out for about a week and a half with the 69 Eyes doing a tour with them. Uh, and then this fall, we'll be back in Europe. So we'll be headed overseas again in September. Uh, September, November, there are there's European dates. October, I can't talk about yet because it's not been announced mm -hmm. but i got something fun coming for october um so uh yeah so in the immediate future i'll be on tour with pretty boy floyd um in a matter of weeks amazing right on man well again thank you so much for taking the time to be here and for bestowing upon us all of your wisdom of which you have much and uh, for everyone watching, this has been the What's Your Truth podcast. We'll see you on the next episode. Later. Yeah, you follow your own rules and you preach them on to me. But you don't think before you act and you ain't got no business with me. You know, no. But then what's your truth? Oh, what's your truth? Now you got down on your